Welcome to OA week. We are just going to wait a few minutes for people to sign in and we will get started very soon. Thank you for being here on time. We're still going to let a few more people join us. So if you'll just bear with us for a few more minutes. All right. In the interest of time, and because I know that our presenters have a lot of very interesting information to share with us, I'm just going to start. Welcome to OA Week 2024. My name is Katarina Schuh. I'm with the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, and I'm also part of the Goa on Secretariat, which is why it's my pleasure to be able to welcome you here today. So I would just like to start by introducing our four sponsoring agencies. So Ocean Certification is brought to you by GOAN, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, as well as the IAEA OAICC, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency's Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And we also are sponsored by NOAA, the US National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and last but not least by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, Cultural Organization, the UNESCO. So OA Goa On was uh, formed in 2012 with just a handful of members, and we've since grown to a network of more than 1,200 members globally from around 114 countries. We also have 10 regional hubs, and uh, we will continue to hear but more of the regional science uh, as the week progresses. And we will welcome you as you're not a member yet to please sign up for Go On. So OA Week started in 2020 and 2021 when due to the COVID pandemic, uh, conferences were canceled or postponed. And Go On thought it would be a good idea to keep the momentum going around ocean acidification research and to give a platform to share all of the latest uh, science. In 2022, when we were able to travel again, we had a very successful uh, Ocean and High CO2 World Symposium in Lima, Peru. And since then, the community has asked us to bring back OA Week repeatedly. So in 2023, and here we are again in 2024, and we're delighted to be able to present you again, a very interesting lineup of presentations, sessions, and perspectives. So with that, I would like to give you a little bit of um, housekeeping. You'll notice that the session is being recorded and will be uh, shown on the Go On YouTube channel soon. There's a Q&A box that you can type your questions into for the presenters. You can also use the raise your hand button and we will call upon you um, after the presentations. So without any further ado, I would like to hand over to your moderator, Jesse Turner from the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification and the UN Foundation. Jesse, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Katerina. And uh, just make, vibe check, this uh, sounds all right and, and is coming through my uh, internet. Great. Well, hello, everybody. Really excited to be with you. And I am calling in from Baku, uh, Aber. <laughs> from Baku today. Um, uh, we are here at COP29 and uh, I'm not going to fumble through because I'm now my tongue is tied. Um, and 
I'm not going to do it. Anyway, we're here at COP29 um, at the UN Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change Conference. And uh, I'm really excited. I thought that it would be a good opportunity instead of just going right into a presentation on a little bit of the international and, uh, and domestic policy landscape for Go On Week, just to talk a little bit about what's happening here um, in Azerbaijan. I know I can say it. I just got nervous. Um, and, uh, and I have got some great pictures to kind of share out and, and just show you what it's like um, over here on the ground. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and it is chaos. That's all right. Um, so here we are. Um, this is what the intro to COP uh, looks like. Uh, lots of delegates coming in. We started on the 12th of, uh, of November and, uh, and it's been a crazy kind of show ever since. The way that the pavilions are sort of organized um, is that you all come in and there's one uh, session where there's lots of different um, pavilions for different countries that um, are there to talk about some of the work that they're doing. Lots of different NGOs, different science institutions, different thematic hubs like a food systems hub or an ocean hub um, or just transition hub and things like that. Then there's an area for um, the actual plenary talks that go on all day long, side room for official meetings having to do with how governments are implementing and interpreting implementation of the Paris Climate Agreement. And then a whole other area that is dedicated um, specifically um, for, uh, for delegate meetings. And so that's sort of the way that the layout works, but it's this grand uh, coliseum, if you will, this grand stadium that's sort of set up to, to cater to that. And here's some folks coming in uh, the front doors just there. And the big theme of this particular COP, every COP sort of has uh, the presidency, um, it usually has a, a preference of what they might want to talk about from a thematic standpoint. For example, COP25 was hosted by Chile, and Chile was a big ocean advocate and really wanted to talk about ocean being better represented and reflected in the Paris Climate Agreement. And so they kind of tried to coin that the ocean COP. I'm just putting a stopwatch here so I know where I'm doing. And uh, and then we've had different cops looking at uh, adaptation, looking at food, and this one is really dedicated to finance. So thinking about how do countries start to support uh, a big fund, particularly from developed countries that would go to supporting developing or least developed countries, both in the energy transition um, to get off fossil fuels, but also to think about ideally different adaptation strategies. And I don't mean ideally because ideally we're going to need a lot of adaptation to climate change, but ideally because oftentimes adaptation is left out of the financing conversation. And so really making sure that countries are not just responsible for helping countries transition um, and, and funding some of the work, what that's gonna look like, but also for adaptation and resilience to climate change impacts. And from an acidification perspective, uh, what we're here trying to, and, and have been for several years, trying to get people to understand is that because Carbon emissions is the direct cause of ocean acidification, um, and the UNFCCC is responsible for, for mitigating and responding to the impacts of greenhouse gases and carbon emissions. There's a direct relationship to the UNFCCC's responsibility uh, to support countries in their acidification work. So that's been a really big conversation that we've been, again, part of um, ocean advocates um, here at the UNFCCC for, for several years. This slide, um, this is one example of uh, things that are taking place all throughout the different hallways um, that about just and equitable transition. As you can see here, both phasing out fossil fuels and if you can see the sign in the background, pay up. Um, so really um, it, emphasis here again on making sure that countries are um, raising and contributing to a global fund that would support that just transition to phase out fossil fuels and to support countries and adaptation needs. And that's been a really big uh, agenda item this year. Um, I think I'm gonna play this if it doesn't come through, that's okay, it's only a minute and a half. Uh, this is a colleague of ours from SPREP, which is the Secretariat for the Pacific Regional Environmental Program. Um, he is the Climate Change Finance Readiness Advisor. Um, and I actually had him video today for a group of fellows in Australia um, that are working on climate change issues. And, uh, and I wanted to capture a little bit of sentiment back to them uh, because they all represent different Pacific Island uh, countries and territories. Uh, but I thought it was a nice video that maybe gives everyone here a little bit more perspective or context as well about, uh, about what this uh, conversation kind of looks like. So I'll go ahead and play it. If we can't hear it quite right, it's only, it's only a minute and a half. So Hopefully not too bad.
Can you hear? There's no sound, is it? No sound? No sound, sorry. Most bother everybody at the hotel here. Uh, in uh, very and the issues around trans gestures. I think there is a bit of a challenge with the new collective on the right goal. Uh, the spec has been pushing for the goal to ensure that it achieves 1.5 degrees, but also issues around simplified access, predictable access, and also ground based analysis. Uh, the challenge at the top now is to, for countries to be able to come together. There are pushes for the goal to be an investment goal, but I think with the realities that a lot of the seats are facing, of course, is confirmed that it is accepted in China, but also achieving the one point five degree goal. That is fundamental to the Pacific. We are calling for a 39 billion flow allocation for the Pacific uh, for seats uh, on a yearly paid basis until 2025. We are also calling for run based funding, but also simple fair access to the resource available. This is a challenge for the Pacific at COP29, and we are pushing that as a key message in control. A climate finance and then taking up the new policy. Thank you very much, and you all enjoy the fellowship. That applies to all of you except the fellowship part. Um, but as you can, you know, maybe piece out some of the elements there. One, it's just kind of a chaotic space. This is an example of what that pavilion space looks like. So this is the Secretariat for the Pacific Regional Program or the Moana Blue Pacific Pavilion. Um, I like to call it the OG or the original ocean pavilion. There is now a different ocean pavilion that um, has been set up. But the Pacific has always held space at these climate cops for a, a ocean focused conversation. And, uh, and so here in this example, um, you know, you could hear the 1.5 target. I don't know if you were able to pull that out, but that, of course, is what the Paris Climate Agreement is all about, which is keeping emissions uh, emissions reductions in line with not exceeding 1.5 uh, degrees or two degrees, um, I guess, is the official Paris Climate Agreement Celsius. And there is a big push um, by groups like the Pacific um, to say that two is too high, that we need to be thinking about ambition for reductions to keep emissions to 1.5. And, um, and so that's been a really big calling card across uh, developing countries, but particularly ocean countries, and, uh, and thinking about how they are delivering that message. One thing that you all will know as ocean acidification practitioners probably is that temperature targets alone don't really tell the whole story of acidification. In fact, they don't tell any story about ocean acidification. Um, as you all know, you know, warming, of course, is caused by greenhouse gas emissions and, and global warming, and that's leading to warming of our oceans and sea level rise. Um, however, acidification is caused directly by CO2 emissions. And so no matter, uh, you know, the temperature target, those CO2 emissions already in our ocean are continuing to amplify acidification. And so that's just one way that we're trying to get governments under this particular conference to better understand that, you know, we do need to obviously be increasing ambition to reduce carbon emissions, but that by not accounting for ocean acidification impacts, they're really missing a whole piece of climate readiness climate adaptation needs, climate resilience needs, um, that of course, many of you are all involved in, in helping understand what that's gonna look like on the ground. So just wanted to give you a little bit of that context. The second thing um, that that uh, Mr. Pattison said was uh, the new collective quantified goal. I might have gone that incorrect, but it's the new finance goal. That's what he's just speaking about. And, uh, and that you really need grants, not just loans. There's this big discussion in climate adaptation funding between grants and loans loans, just like you have to pay back. Of course, there's different ways to make interest lower and, and incentivize um, projects, but a lot of the needs are going to be grants. And uh, and so that's one big element as well that we're sort of talking about here. So just wanted to give a little bit of that context and perspective. Oh, okay. Um, here is a great photo that I'm really happy to share out. I don't know if any of you um, have come across or work um, with OA Africa or in the Western Indian Ocean, but the speaker here is Dr. Rashinisha George, who is the um, OA, Af uh, OA Tanzania lead um, and do leading a lot of the ocean acidification work in Tafiri, which is the Tanzanian Fisheries and Research Institute. And here he is at a, at a site event that we uh, were co-hosting with the Commonwealth governments. Um, and so we were talking with the Commonwealth. Um, they have a blue uh, 
charter working on different topics. Ocean acidification is one of them. And here is uh, Dr. Roshanisha speaking about the needs in Tanzania, about the great work and leadership they've been leading to build a baseline, and then to think about biological research um, across the Western Indian Ocean that they're going to need to make good decisions about adaptation resilience in the context of food security. So this is a great um, side event that happened and a really one of the first times that we've been talking about food security explicitly here at the COP. Uh, a second picture, you might be familiar with this person, some of you in the room. Um, so in the center there is Dr. Naira Sheltut, um, who is uh, at the NIOF, which is the National Institute of Ocean, uh, National Institute of Oceanograph Oceanogra oceanography and fisheries in Egypt. And uh, Dr. Sheltut also leads OA Africa, uh, as a co-chair to OA Africa um, in, in the northern part in, out of Egypt. And, uh, and then on her right is uh, Jana Friedrich, who is the uh, lab director at the IAEA OA Coordinating Center, or is the uh, IAEA lab director and, uh, and supports the OA Coordinating Center. And uh, the, here they are having a conversation that was actually put on by the UN Law of the Sea Secretariat here at the UNFCCC. Um, so you start to see this interplay between these different conventions where you've got the UNFCCC, um, which is responsible for mitigating CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions, the UN Law of the Sea, which is responsible for regulating fisheries. And here we're having a conversation about where those two meet and why the impacts of acidification are so important when it comes to fisheries at all scales. And, and it was a really lovely conversation where Yana and Dr. Shaltut and Naira were talking about their work both in OA Africa as well as the IAEA, OA Coordinating Center, to do more research on seafood species specifically and their impact and their uh, responses to acidification. So here you see, you know, sort of our, our science colleagues um, at the highest levels of international policy really leading. And it was just so exciting uh, to be witnessing and, and, uh, and, and watching this conversation. Uh, and then finally, and then I'll, I'll get into some other stuff. Here is a picture of um, Dar George Rushingisha, uh, or Rushingisha George, uh, behind me, as you can see. Um, and here we are with the entire Tanzanian delegation meeting with the, in the center, um, a, a woman named Pamela Lavera, who is with the African Union Climate Action Secretariat. And it was a wonderful opportunity to go and talk from the Tanzanian delegation, speaking about the work that they're leading both in Tafiri, but also across Western Indian Ocean um, and Wyomsa. And here they are talking about that work to the African Union and uh, talking about the funding that they're going to need to really make a regional OA program uh, that's going to serve the six countries in the Western Indian Ocean. And what I really love about this picture is Pamela has been a dear colleague. You know, they're not ocean people. They're not ocean people at all. They're climate people. They're food people. And uh, and it's been this really new dialogue that we're trying to really open up with traditional climate uh, policymakers to help them understand why this ocean acidification work is so important to climate adaptation and to resilience and to making, again, building that baseline, understanding trends, thinking about biological research, but really thinking about how that's going to inform adaptation agendas for decades to come. And it can't just be a project by project type of OA um, lens. You really have to think about it as baked into these ongoing um, policy goals. So that was a little, oh, and last but not least, sorry, I promise I'll be fast, fast on the other presentation. Um, but this is just a great picture um, that happened just this morning. I'm so thrilled for it. Uh, this in the center is the FAO, so the UN uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, um, and it's the head of their fisheries department. Um, and then to his right, we have some colleagues, both from the Pacific, from Egypt, from uh, Malawi, and then on the left-hand side, some colleagues um, that work on fisheries and food security issues, blue food and food security issues at different NGOs like World Wildlife Fund or, or EDF and World Fish. And it was a great opportunity just to bring those groups together and talk about the need for increased OA research to better inform climate resilient fisheries in the context of climate change. And so um, again, that was a really meaningful to sort of roundtable conversation. And you can see here, uh, Dr. Shaltut, uh, you know, being one of the ch key chief scientists in the room uh, talking about acidification work. Okay. So with that, um, maybe I will 
pause um, just for any questions um, around the COP negotiations, and then I can get into a little bit more of the domestic uh, policy that the OA Alliance uh, is leading. But uh, I'll, I'll maybe make some some space for that because it is an interesting and, and timely conversation. Um, so any any comments, questions, reactions, things you've been reading uh, in the news or or anything anything uh, on our minds regarding COP? Great. All right. Sounds good. Uh, apologies. Let me do that. Okay. Oh boy. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So I'll just quickly say these were the two side events that we hosted at the COP. Um, so what I'm going to talk about a lot today is how we are working with governments to think about incorporating acidification across mainstream climate and ocean policy. Uh, oh no. Yep. That's how crazy my life is, guys. Sorry. Um, and again, our side event, particularly on uh, climate ocean change and food security. So those were the two main events that we hosted at the COP and a lot of our, our engagement with governments are around those themes. Just pulling back a little bit um, through the OA Alliance, I think we've talked about this before for those of you that have joined these types of presentations, but you know, I just wanna give a little bit of a, outside of COP, the big international um, framework and picture for thinking about how ocean acidification is represented um, across UN systems. So we just talked a lot about the UNFCCC um, and thinking about how ocean issues, including acidification, are better reflected in the mitigation, adaptation, and increasingly finance agendas associated with that type of uh, instrument. There is now an ocean and climate dialogue at the UNFCCC, and that creates a great space for parties to come together, talk about what their needs are, and start to prioritize how the UNFCCC can better support them. The UN Sustainable Development Goal Agenda, as you all know, 2030 Agenda, has an ocean acidification target uh, to, uh, to uh, report and measure acidification. But through the Alliance, we really want to make sure that we're also looking at the uh, policy and investments that are going to be needed to minimize and address ocean acidification. You all should know, I think, that the UN Decade of Ocean Science has an OA research program. If you don't, welcome, join us. It's fun. Um, and the OA Research um, for Sustainability program under the UN Decade of Ocean Science is really working um, at global and local scales to identify the best type of OA information for management and decision making. So again, moving from that open ocean observing of, um, you know, saying, you know, when carbon emissions go up, pH goes down, and really thinking about regional trends um, and more local uh, coastal zone information for thinking about what governments can actually do in addition to reducing emissions around the management and decision making of acidification. Uh, and then finally, uh, the Our Ocean Conference provides a wonderful place outside the UN system to have governments make commitments to better understand and step up on leadership on this particular topic. At the national level, um, I think many of you know that we work, uh, I'll just say, um, the Economist Impact Group uh, just recently, last year, uh, launched a, a report um, called Ocean Acidification, A Time for Action, and basically calling national governments into creating domestic actions around ocean acidification, whether it's a standalone policy or incorporating acidification into their domestic strategies. And notably, the economists called it a mounting crisis, you know, ocean acidification, and was really specific to say that national governments need to be taking more leadership on this topic. Um, and to kind of follow a little bit on that, I was really proud that last year um, at COP28, the United States actually released their OA action plan, which is sort of their strategy for uh, working, uh, continuing to build on the legacy of work that they've done for the past 10 to 12 years on acidification in the United States, um, and really making sure that it's um, interacting with other work that they're doing on blue carbon, on offshore renewables, on exploring marine carbon dioxide removal strategies, on the adaptation and resiliency strategy when it comes to fisheries and aquaculture, um, and so that, and even exploring the nexus with wastewater and uh, upgrading wastewater treatment plants so that will improve the conditions um, coastally to not exacerbate coastal acidification. And uh, building on that, the Alliance said, you know, Let's call more governments to action at the national level. And so after uh, COP28, we really invited more national governments to join us to implement SDG 14 
2.3 to minimize and address acidification and to do it by next year's UN Ocean Conference, which is going to be in June 2025. And so it really gave a nice um, deadline for them to have some ideas of what they needed to do to codify or to integrate acidification work into some national strategies. And to help them do that, we created something called an OA Action Plan Leadership Circle. Um, governments really love to be leaders. Governments really like to step up and they really like to join peer-to-peer -peer conversations. Um, and so this was a great way to bring about 14 different governments that we invited their ministries, their departments, their policy officers, and said, we're going to help you reach SDG 14.3 to minimize and address acidification from a policy side. Um, and we're going to give a little bit of support and handholding along the way. And so this year uh, at our ocean conference, we met um, and had a round table. We had about 15 different ministries show up. Uh, it was quite diverse. It was a really wonderful conversation. And we said, we want to support you. Tell us what you need. And, uh, and we had a conversation that kind of uh, looked like this. You know, we wanted to get a little bit of more information about them. What are their regionally significant marine ecosystems? Um, what are their significant resources? What is the um, importance of them for fisheries, tourism, aquaculture, et cetera? We wanted to know a little bit in their unique region, what were the trends and concerns? You know, what entities outside government do they rely on for ocean information or for climate change information? Um, and how does that get integrated into their decision making uh, at a national level? And then we said, which policy approaches do you think work best for integrating acidification? Um, which OA mitigation strategies are you working on? Which adaptation strategies might you already be working on? And how can we just make all of that a bit more holistic, a bit more robust by making sure that acidification is one extra um, measurement or parameter that's incorporated? And then, of course, we had a lot of in-person meetings, and you can see continuing conversations and events at, uh, at uh, uh, venues like this. And so to, to help them through that, we created some policy guidance across key frameworks that national governments actually are using already. So um, the first on the right-hand side is accounting for ocean acidification in nationally determined contributions, or NDC is the short acronym for that, or a national adaptation plan. And that is something that all parties that are part of the Paris Climate Agreement have to put together and update every so many years. The NDC is how are you going to reduce carbon emissions and why is it important to do so? Uh, carbon and greenhouse gas emissions and why is it important to do so? What strategies are you going to use to do it? A national adaptation plan is kind of what it sounds like. How are you going? What are you? What do you need to adapt to climate change impacts? What do you need to measure? How are you thinking about risk and vulnerability assessments? Um, and we wanted to create guidance to really make sure that countries could integrate acidification across that type of portfolio. The center one is something called a sustainable ocean plan um, that's very specific to members of something called the high level panel on ocean, uh, sustainable ocean for a sustainable ocean economy. There's about 14 national government members that are putting together these SOPs or sustainable ocean plans. They mostly have to do with resilient fisheries um, and often they do not include and conservation measures often they do not include climate change. And so we're really making sure and providing guidance to help them integrate acidification across that work. And as a reminder, not every country is going to have a lot of ocean acidification science work to talk about. Um, as you all know, there's many different capacities at different countries and even different regional approaches. Our goal is to say you need to incorporate why this issue is important to fisheries management, conservation targets, uh, locally managed areas, waste uh, uh, pollution control, blue carbon projects, coastal, coastal habitat um, utilization, and you need to put some stretch goals in for thinking about what your ocean acidification knowledge gaps and needs are, because only if you put them in these types of documents can we actually start to think about the usable science for that purpose, and can we start to go and get funding to help support that type of work. So that's why it's so important to have it incorporated. And then last but not least, you're going to hear a little bit more about this from Incan in the next presentation, but we work to create guidance for countries to incorporate acidification across in Europe a common directive that they use called the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which basically helps and requires European governments to measure and evaluate the impact of, uh, or, or the uh, evaluate good environmental status in their marine waters. And of course, climate change is often not thought about in that, in that particular reporting um, metric. 
So I'm going to just speed through this because I think we're good. Um, I was going to be a little more context, but I think you, you get the point. Um, and uh, here's finally a picture um, of uh, an event that we had on this particular topic, the leadership circle providing the guidance. And uh, we had some wonderful testimonials from Greece, actually, um, the Hellenic Republic in the center talking about how they're taking up this work. Um, and we've got lots of great engagement um, from the United States, from France, Palau, um, from Colombia, uh, and many others. So it's been a really uh, fruitful um, way to engage these national governments uh, over the last year or so. So with that, thank you um, for uh, indulging a little bit of the COP overview. Hopefully it was not too boring, um, but uh, but just a little bit of an insight into sort of these um, bigger climate change conversations where we do have a long way to go to think about incorporating uh, acidification in those types of spaces in addition to our more traditional marine management areas. So. Inken, uh, with that, I'd love to turn it over to my dear colleague um, at the OA Alliance, who's our European policy lead. Uh, maybe it's a nice segue, Inken, to turn it over to you to talk more about your work leading um, the work under under uh, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, let me just quickly change and <laughs> share my slides. All right, I hope, wait, can you see the slides right now? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Well, first of all, thank you, Jesse, for the introduction. And I also want to thank the Goa on uh, Network for providing us with this opportunity to present at the 2024 OA week. Uh, before diving into our specific recommendations for the EU member states to integrate ocean acidification across the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, I would like to give a brief overview of our European project here at the OA Alliance. So the EU projects uh, started with the idea that the EU shares a unique policy and legal structure due to its uh, framework of member states, different member states coming together. Uh, and the EU has also contributed an extensive amount of OA related research through regional seas conventions such as OSPA through the Arctic Council, but also through the global OA networks. Um, so with that, the question arose on how um, this knowledge is translated into legal and regulatory frameworks. Um, and with this question in mind, we then um, made, uh, did a, a hosted a workshop uh, at the European Maritime Day in Brest on May 2023, uh, which explored the marine management and policy responses uh, to ocean acidification and brought together policy and decision makers from across Europe. Um, we discussed topics such as OA trends, biological impacts and threats to uh, keystone species, but we also looked at reports um, and OA recommendations such as the then recently published uh, 2023 OSPA quality status report and obviously which is the focus of this presentation we looked at relevant EU and national ocean and marine policy frameworks. Um, after that we focused our research more on specific conventions and bodies um, that can be used to address ocean acidification with regards to international frameworks we looked at the OSPA convention the Helsinki Convention under HELCOM, uh, the Barcelona Convention, the Bucharest Convention, and the Arctic Council. And specific to the EU, we looked at directives um, such as the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which we are going to focus on later on as well, the Marine Spatial Planning Directive, the Water Framework Directive, the Nitrates Directive, the Habitats Directive, and the Birds Directive. After this more gen, oh no, sorry. Um, <laughs> With this um, research that we did now on all the conventions and the directives, we then published our first uh, guidance document, which was a two-pager uh, of which you can see the second page right here, uh, which gives a short overview and highlights the importance of uh, each of the frameworks and how they can help uh, address ocean acidification. So, and then with this more general research done and with some discussions we had with the EU Commission, uh, we then decided or it became apparent to us that uh, with the pending revision of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, uh, it becomes necessary to look at the Marine Strategy Framework Directive specifically 
Um, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, as Jesse already mentioned before, it has a, the aim to protect the marine environment, uh, especially the marine ecosystem and the biodiversity. Its goal is thereby to achieve the so-called good environmental status of the EU marine waters. And uh, the de determination of the good environmental status is done by dividing the EU waters into regions and subregions, and then assessing them on the basis of 11 uh, qualitative descriptors. As is highlighted by the preamble, the determination of good environmental status must adapt over time to address human-induced environmental concerns. With OA obviously being one of these concerns, we started to then work on an inclusion of OA into the MSFD and the determination of good environmental status. However, as the official re revision of the... Um, of the MSFD will only be done by 2030. There are many important interim deadlines that can help to proactively uh, push for the inclusion of OA and cl other climate ocean issues into the MSFD. As some ex examples of these interim deadlines are the reporting uh, for monitoring programs and the programs of measures, which are to be done by 2026 and 2027. Um, where especially voluntary action by the member states uh, to include OA can help suggest the need for such an update and highlight member states' leadership. Voluntary action can also uh, help show the way in finding best practices. So with this, these aims in mind, we began to convene informal stakeholder meetings, bringing together program leads from different member st states, regional seas conventions, but also uh, science experts um, to then discuss together um, on how to bring this input and the guidance together into this guidance document, which is called Addressing Ocean Acidification Across the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. It uh, is generally intended as a guidance for policymakers and other pro program leads, but also as uh, for scientists and communicators on how and why OA and OA information can best be integrated into the MSFD. The key recommendations of this guidance document draw on the existing distinction between ocean and coastal acidification by highlighting that OA is not only caused by an increase in CO2 emissions, but also by other coastal pressures such as nutrient pollution. Uh, we therefore decided to divide um, both types of acidification between two descriptors in particular. Uh, the first one, Descriptor 5, which focuses on human-induced eutrophication, lends itself to the incorporation of two OA, sorry, on two OA parameters, pH and total alkalinity, thereby helping to measure and address um, coastal acidification. Uh, with Descriptor 7, on the other hand, um, we tried to... Uh, oh no, sorry, Descriptor 7, which is concerned uh, with uh, hydrographical conditions, uh, of the marine ecosystems, we realized that it is better to reflect the climate ocean changes and the issue of ocean acidification specifically. Uh, the descriptor will benefit from a broadening of its scope to also include chemical conditions, including OA parameters such as PCO2 and dissolved inorganic carbon. Uh, it is uh, also relevant that besides these two descriptors, we have a, a third recommendation, which focuses on uh, OA information that should be reported to the regional seas conventions, such as OSPA or HELCOM, as mentioned before, uh, to create a greater harmony and to establish uh, more informed and coordinated regional research. Uh, okay, um, we then um, also developed other um, guidance documents to support this bigger and more general um, EU Marine Strategy Framework Directive guidance. Uh, we specifically developed four different flyers. The first one, which you can see right now on the screen, uh, is intended as a general uh, flyer to be handed out as at conferences um, to just give a 
a quick overview of the bigger guidance. We also um, published the this second uh, flyer, which uh, is then also trying to connect um, the issue of coastal acidification between the Water Framework Directive, which is another directive, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive Descriptive 5, and the Nitrates Directive, and showcase how th all three need to work together to address the issue of coastal acidification. Uh, the third flyer showcases the need for ongoing OA monitoring and research. Um, this information can and should be applied by member states to better understand OA impact on marine ecosystems, species, food webs, uh, all of which is required by a separate set, uh, by a separate set of um, descriptors, namely descriptor one, four, and six, also of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. We finally then came up with a flyer which promotes the need for more developed uh, and coordinated biological research uh, by the regional seas conventions. It highlights the existing connections for member states uh, by suggesting that ongoing and re refined OA information should inform governments uh, planning around the topics of food security, blue economies, but also national management strategies. All right, so this is the last slide now. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, highlight that as of this month, the OA Alliance has uh, become a member or, or an official observer to the Commission Expert Group on Strategic Coordination for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which is, which is trying to help uh, further integrate the MSFD. Um, with that, we hope to work even closer together with e with the EU itself and its member states in the process of adapting the Marine Strategy Framework Directive to climate ocean is issues such as OA. And uh, then we also identified some possible overlaps and synergies between the Goa on networks and the OA Alliance. First of all, uh, we believe that there is uh, strength in highlighting and sharing the importance of integrating OA information across the MSFD. Then uh, we are also intending to develop and support case studies of uh, specific member states, which take up this inclusion of OA into the MSFD uh, voluntarily. And we believe that scientific uh, research is the basis of such uh, case studies. Uh, and then we are also continuing to um, bring together informal stakeholder groups uh, like this, an informal stakeholder group across member states and other relevant entities, uh, where we uh, think that Gorn's input and engagement could help uh, shape and advance not only policy briefs, but also workshop, high level events, and connections of OA science and policy across Europe. With that, I would like to thank you for listening to um, my presentation. And we have the QR code here to our resources that I just mentioned in this presentation. Um, yeah, thank you. Ah, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Inken. Super awesome job. And I should correct the record that Inken is a member of the expert working group on the strategic implementation of the MSFD. Uh, rather, she's been uh, single-handedly representing the OA Alliance there and, uh, and really um, proud of that type of integration. And um, so thank you so much for the overview, Inken. And, and before we get to the next presenter, just because I, I do think we have a, a bit of time with 90, we have 90 minutes. Um, for this, uh, yes, for this. Uh, I, I do wanna just call out Louisa. I, I know, um, I don't know if you're allowed to uh, to come off mute, uh, but Louisa Gianotti with um, the Hellenic Research, uh, with the Hellenic Marine Research Center. Um, I don't know if you wanna share your experience, Louisa, because you've been quite involved in um, being the connecting point between the science, um, much of which that you've been leading in Greece and sort of working with their ministry to think about how they are the champions right now integrating acidification across the MSFD. And as we saw in that previous presentation from COP this week, even the, the secretary general from the Ministry of Environment uh, coming to talk about it very very expertly. Um, so Louisa, do you wanna share your experience with, with that interface between the science and policy world on this topic? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, hello, hello to all. Uh, nice to see such a great work. Um, and I'm really glad that I've been part of this work as well. 
Um, I love the fact that I saw our uh, General Secretary of Environment in COP29 being uh, so engaged um, because it has been a a struggle trying to connect. But in the past uh, year, together with uh, Jesse and the OE Alliance, um, it has happened. And uh, I think we finally have them on board in uh, realizing how important it is to have these uh, carbon net parameters, not only uh, like being monitored, being constantly monitored and not having a scarcity of data, trying to have the government on board. So mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm really glad this is, this is taking a really, really good shape, I think. Mm. Well, thank you, Louisa. And it's been totally, uh, you know, again, just that partnership between the science community, uh, yourself included, you know, there's no way that that uh, those recommendations could have been so clean and um, well researched without the participation of the OSPAR convention, go on Northeast Atlantic Hub, and go on MedHub yeah. was quite involved yeah. in, in helping us put those together. So it is a joint product. Yeah. And, uh, and it's just a great, I hope, um, case study, you know, as we think about, and maybe that's a, a nice segue to you, PB, and I'll, I'll turn it over, you know, and thinking about how can we find the right constituencies in the right location to have this conversation around the emerging science work and the policy landscape that's going to be most useful. Um, so perhaps that's yeah. a the, uh, correct um, uh, segue. So I'm happy to... Uh, pr- Excited to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Professor uh, Panias Lok uh, Bahadburi, who is at the Indian Institute of Science, uh, Education and Research at Calcutta in India. And um, PB is gonna share a little bit more with us about developing, again, that effective OA research-based policy framework um, in in this case, the Global South and the importance of that local and regional perspective. Um, so really excited to uh, to turn it over to you, PB, for your perspectives and your your leadership on this uh, in this work. So over to you. Thank you so much, Jesse, and thank you for the kind words. Uh, I'll just quickly share the presentation. Just bear with me. Okay. Let me see. I don't know whether it's a full screen or not yet. Not yet. Uh, yeah, it's I, we can see your full screen, but you're on like presentation mode for the slideshow. Uh, oh, okay, if you want okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll change it here. Just a moment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One second. Oh, I need to do the inter screen. Yeah, got it. Now it should work. How about now? Yeah, should be working. Yes. Ah, okay. That... Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, that's not bad. Uh, but so uh, I'm going to uh, take it over where uh, JC started, and and you, you can continue. Uh, but I'll try to connect uh, some of the. Uh, local and regional perspectives, which might be very, very important when we are trying to integrate uh, OA policy, uh, science of OA into policy frameworks, uh, keeping global south into context. Uh, just to give you a perspective, as, as has been highlighted by Katharina before, uh, the global ocean acidification observing network is actually really, which started as a voluntary movement and is and still voluntary is really strategically placed because it has got 10 regional hubs and out of these 10 regional hubs, at least four of these hubs are uh, working uh, across geographical dimensions, which truly represent the global south. So essentially these regional hubs are able to understand the pulses of local and regional perspectives, which would be very, very important, not only for taking the science of way forward, but also how effectively this can be integrated uh, into existing uh, policies across these regions. This knowledge has also helped uh, tremendously for another program, which JC has also pointed out before, the Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability, where uh, there are seven outcomes. Uh, JC is, lead, is leading uh, the policy engagement along with myself uh, 
And all of these uh, outcomes are strongly interlinked. And of course, as you very rightly see that the last, and but not the least, is extremely important. And uh, therefore, such kind of knowledge products which came out uh, in the last, uh, you know, the Convention on Biological Diversity in Cali, Colombia, these kind of knowledge products are going to be very, very useful to take or to connect the science of way with the policies. Now, just to give you a, a very uh, different perspective of really how we, I believe the policy framework landscapes work in some parts of the global south. If you look, it has got a four-tier system. Uh, the base is the multi-sectoral stakeholders, uh, where they, which are mostly represented by everybody, including, of course, the policymakers. But the voices of the indigenous and the local communities or the coastal communities are extremely important. These voices are then shaped into local policies. These local policies then being taken up into provincial and state policies. And then ultimately, it gets integrated into national policies. So if, if this four-tier system, if you look at it, there are a couple of things that needs to be understood. One is the political landscape. Who runs these policies? Rather, the way of saying it is that where does the electoral mandate comes for integrating these policies? These are essentially being run by the elected representatives who are either part of the local and regional governments. And therefore, uh, these allergies might change locally and regionally, and therefore the prioritization of the policies might change. So it's extremely important as, as scientists and, and or as advocates of OE research that we continuously engage with these LRG communities, because once that is done, these policies needs to be statu you know, needs balancing out through, through statutory uh, approaches, and that can have local and regional ways of doing it. Once that is done, uh, there is a, a budget provision that has to be included. So this four-tier system, which is the middle one, also has another four-tier system, which is the smaller one. Now, all of this, if you have in place, then you have the national policies. And of course, sometimes it could be a completely a reverse way of doing it, where, where, the, where, the, where a nation actually commits to many of the international frameworks or the regional frameworks, and then it can again come down from the top to the bottom. But the argument would be that it should start from the base, which is the which is the multi-sectoral stakeholders, and go up irrespective of the international uh, frameworks or the regional frameworks. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that all of this, when we are doing developing these, uh, you know, frameworks or integrating the way science into the frameworks, we need to understand time is an issue. Uh, this time will not be universal. Uh, there will be many, many factors which would control uh, locally and regionally, and therefore the pace at which this integration process is going to happen will, will take some time. So therefore the continuous engagement is important and and the, and the, thus way week, which is happening, you know, is extremely important to understand some of these aspects. Now, one thing also to keep in mind is when we look at any policy framework or any of the policies that are there, whether it's related to climate change or mitigation, or the adaptation, how much of the voices of the coastal communities are being heard? Well, I would say in a slightly different way that the voices of the coastal communities uh, do not necessarily get integrated. Given the fact that 40% of the global population resides within 100 kilometers of the coastal uh, zones and they are facing everyday risk from sea level rise, extreme weather events, and of course, which we do not talk about, but in the last few years have become very, very prominent, the ocean acidification. All of these are driving livelihood uncertainties, including loss of uh, indigenous and local knowledge. And ultimately, the prioritization of the indigenous or the local communities or the vulnerable coastal communities, their voices somehow get marginalized to a large, large extent. So if we are to have effective way policies that can sustain and that can change or transform the lives, we really need to engage with these marginal, marginalized coastal communities. Now, to be able to do that, uh, of course, the financing would be one of the most important thing. And you know, uh, this is in COP uh, in in Azerbaijan. A lot of these discussions are happening. One of the biggest issues we think we know is that over the years we have seen that if we are to call in for a policy with the boom financing, we have to overcome the bankability barriers. Uh, it cannot be that the philanthropic institutions continue to support this initiative. Uh, the big financing institutions need to come into the picture. And if we want to see the role of the big financing institutions, we have to start look out of the box thoughts. You know, for example, parameters 
specific insurance. Uh, this is something which is slightly different approach has been adopted in, in Philippines as an example and, of, and on, on the way of adopting uh, in, in implementation in, uh, I believe in Mauritius, uh, where uh, the financial institutions are going to put in a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, financing mechanisms uh, along with the national actors or the regional actors keeping into perspective emerging uh, uh, threats from climate change, such as ocean acidification. Uh, when we are talking about financing and, and we, are, we, we are going to play a very, very important role, I mean, we means the community uh, uh, where we're going to help shape the nations or the regions in terms of policies, uh, money is going to be extremely important. So uh, one way probably to look into is the biodiversity and carbon credits, of course, there are some question marks that there. Just 10 minutes ago, I have just seen one document where the issue of carbon debt has been raised in Azerbaijan uh, Baku meeting. So I think there's going to be a lot more discussions that has to take place. But one thing we do agree that uh, many countries would like to uh, integrate OA into their policies, existing policies. But how do they map the financing institutions or the finances of implementations are very, very critical and therefore mapping blue financing institutions for Global South beyond World Bank, ADP, GEF, uh, and bringing in emerging uh, financing institutions such as BRICS would be very, very important. Last but not the least, we must not forget that the loss and the damage fund and the least developed country fund would be something which can be very nicely tapped if we are to help shape this uh, effectively. Uh, just to give you a perspective or, or to kind of look at it once more, we need at least uh, 100 billion US dollars annually to uh, particularly for the least developing countries and the small island developing states uh, to be able to become resilient or to adapt and mitigate the, the issues of climate change and ocean acidification. And the meeting of Baku is extremely important because this is for the first time the new collective quantified goal on climate finance. NCQG is up for discussion and, and we'll see how member states take it up and how the commitments really go goes. But I think one would be very, very important when you're talking about Global South is harmonization, simplify, simplification and direct access procedures needs to be uh, you know, developed and shaped that can help tap the international climate fund. So knowledge products, the way we integrate with the, uh, interact and integrate continuously with the policymakers uh, the, here, I think these three steps would be very, very important. But last but not the least, one important thing to keep in mind is that there has to be a biennial transparency reports because until and until we have effective BTRs that can talk about the national inventory reports, progress towards NDCs, policies, measures, climate change impacts, adaptations, we will not be able to, to effectively find the finance that is required for policies and, and implementation on ground, which will transform the lives of marginalized coastal communities. I end with one example where we are working in the Sundarbans. This is the world's largest, uh, you know, contiguous mangrove shared between India and Bangladesh. Uh, it had implications for seven Bay of Bengal countries. Here we are working with the World Bank, with the, with the regional government, with the local government and national government to develop uh, a resilience and sustainable financing, uh, you know, framework. Uh, and these would integrate with the existing policies that are there in the region, keeping in mind food security and sustainable blue economy, adaptation and mitigation, and last but not the least, inclusivity and governance, where uh, gender inclusivity and role of fisherwomen would be very, very important. Last but not the least, we must not forget that if such thing is to materialize, you know, if we really want to see OA uh, being shaped into policy and transform the lives lives of millions of people, such as in Sundarbans, where two million coastal communities are directly dependent, and across the region, the fate of 400 million communities are dependent, we need to have effective policies, continuous engagement, and finding the financing would be very, very important. I would end up uh, saying that this is not just about the coastal communities. It is, it is not just about the coastal ocean states. It's beyond it. Many countries which are in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Himalayas or, for example, in high altitudes, they, have, they, are, they are reeling from climate change and from the effect of changing carbonate chemistry in the ocean. 
Therefore, if, if we have very effective policies that can be implemented, we bring in the robust financial models that can be uh, you know, equitable and, and meets the BTR, we'll be also able to meet the demands and, and, and as per the needs of the uh, communities who live in the mountains. Uh, thank you very much. Just holding for thunderous rounds of applause. Um, awesome, PB, that was such a great overview and uh, just perfectly tracks the conversation at COP with the caveat that still people are not sophisticated at a meeting like this enough on the acidification work to see its inclusion in all of those bullet points that you just described, particularly on those last two slides. Um, but that was such a perfect way that I think linking into the most relevant conversations on those financing pieces um, are just spot on and, and that ocean acidification needs to, you know, be squarely <laughs> rightfully part of that conversation more than it has been now. Um, I'll just quickly say, I really love also just kind of <laughs> your guidance to all of us about the policy and just sort of the time scale of policy and the continuous engagement um, and, and thinking about that, you know, sort of national to regional to local, and that ideally it is iterative and beginning with that community engagement at the local level to find out what, again, concerns are, but also uh, observed impacts and what, or observed changes and, uh, and most meaningful mitigation adaptation choices. And then moving from there, what the policy landscapes and financing needs are gonna be. Um, so just fantastic. Anything you want to add for the good of the order? I know that was all presentation mode, but your reflections on COP, I, I just wish that, um, you know, into future conversations, we can continue to 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 share that voice. I mean, maybe I, I think you saw that earlier video from the um, partners at SPREP that the global goal on finance is the um, <laughs> is the biggest thing on the agenda right now. And and I, I ran off to COP thinking, oh, great. We'll get ocean acidification mentioned, you know, in the in the global goal on finance and, and the new hundred billion dollar fund. And that'll be great. And, uh, and I've just learned now working more with not even ocean people, which are very marginalized from the UNFCCC, but just the adaptation kind of civil society groups that work on adaptation alone, that they don't even know if adaptation is going to be included in that global goal on finance, um, which is just like crazy. But, uh, but what, are, what are your perspectives following along? What, what, any any uh, hope or at least <laughs> perspectives you want to share? <laughs> Uh, no, I think you are there, you know, what's really going on. You're feeling the pulse of it more than I do. But I, I see mm -hmm. that now this uh, interjection just has happened, which has just happened about 20, 30 minutes ago, uh, you know, uh, by led by uh, India and China once again, that uh, wow, what's going to happen about the carbon debt? I think this is now once again going to take us back to this, hey, or the entire round table of how, you, how the financing things are going to look at. But I really like that there is a lot of discussion is going on at the moment on the BTR. I think transparency is something which is which really is required. We have to accept that many regions, including in the global south, for whatever might be the reasons, the challenges, that we do not have effective NDCs, as you have been pointing out, and also national uh, action plan for climate change in place. You know, So I think we need... Mm -hmm. to I I would not see, use use the word help, but I think we need to come together and build that bridge. Uh, and I think the the finance model is extremely going to be important, which are meaningful and does hear the pulses of of the global south. Great. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, just excellent. And. Um... Last but certainly not least, before we will have time for a little bit of a group reflection with everyone and, and Q&A, um, I'm really pleased to introduce a, a dear colleague um, from Washington State Department of Ecology. And uh, and Micah, you know, obviously you're not going to, you know, be Washington State is not uh, embroiled, if you will, in sort of these UN scale, you know, frameworks and and policies, although, um, you know, your governor is quite active in, the, in these uh, UN climate change meetings and has, you know, been a, a leader on acidification internationally and bringing more governments to the issue. So you are more engaged <laughs> than, than other states for sure. Um, but I mean, you, but you do have a lot of experience dealing at that applied level when we're talking about evaluating risk and vulnerability 
to acidification and sort of having the policy framework that responds to that and continues to think about how you quantify that, how you communicate that to different audiences for different purposes. So you guys have really done a lot of that work to kind of cons bring down and implement, you know, conceptualize sort of what that that larger framework is when we just talk about this being part of larger climate scale, at you know, uh, large scale climate adaptation work, um, although not exclusively. So I'm happy uh, that you could join us today. I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about Washington State, uh, the process that you guys have gone through to create the Ocean Acidification Action Plan, but also really what your experience has been as a uh, person re personally responsible, but also within the one of the departments in Washington State responsible for implementing uh, the ocean acidification work in Washington. So over to you, Micah. Thank you, Jesse. Um, are my slides coming through? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So as Jesse said, this is an example of a uh, subnational government response to ocean acidification, an action plan that was generated by Washington State, one of the 50 states in the U.S. And um, here, this is a pretty high level overview of how the kind of the history of acidification response in Washington and what, what we're looking at going forward. <clears throat> Okay, so first I just wanted to begin by talking about why uh, acidification received attention early in Washington state. And one of those reasons is Washington is, uh, has a long history of shellfish farming, um, being one of the largest producers of shellfish that are farmed and wild caught in the United States. And so there were examples in the early 2000s to 2010s of hatchery failures. So. Shellfish farmers, uh, many of them depend on juvenile shellfish coming out of hatchery settings. And there were several years where these juveniles were not being reliably produced. And it was a mystery what was causing the failure at the hatchery level. And through collaboration between the shellfish growers and academic scientists, uh, acidification was determined to be the major cause. Um, and after that, the Washington state government got really concerned about this issue for the economic and cultural well-being of coastal communities. And the governor convened a Blue Ribbon Task Force to come up with a plan to address this issue. Um, and because I, I am a scientist, although I'm talking about the kind of the higher level policy response, I wanted to include one point of science here, which is that there are many ways of measuring acidification here I'm showing you uh, mineral stability, aragonite saturation state. So higher values here are better, lower values are worse. As we're putting more carbon dioxide into the water, this value is being driven down. And again, just wanted to put a couple species here, their levels of sensitivity to this parameter. So pteropods, sea butterflies being the most sensitive, Pacific oysters, commercially important, being somewhat less sensitive, and salmon, both commercially and culturally really important. Um, less sensitive still. But globally, acidification is causing this mineral stability to decline across all oceans. Waters are becoming more corrosive. But in Washington, we started from a different point. So we're already within these biological risk zones. And here again is why uh, Washington was one of the first places to feel these effects in terms of hatchery outcomes. And uh, one of the reasons why the response uh, had to be strong and early in Washington state, because we're already in this zone where carbon pollution is causing biological harm. So as I mentioned, after these hatchery failures, the governor of Washington state convened a really wide panel of experts to come together and generate a report, which became the action plan, the Ocean Certification Action Plan for Washington state. This was uh, called, it's called the Blue Ribbon Panel Report uh, from Knowledge to Action. And it has a really wide range of recommendations about how to understand and respond to acidification as an issue. So these are not uh, in the order that they were presented in the report, but I wanted to touch on some of those recommendations and put up front the reducing the root cause of acidification. So reducing carbon dioxide emissions really has to be first and foremost um, in the public communications and policy response to OA. Next was a recommendation to monitor and forecast ocean chemistry so that we can uh, forecast harms and help industries adapt. 
Uh, after that, studying important species to understand what parts of our economy and ecosystems are going to be affected first. Um, there's also a recommendation to understand the impacts of nutrient inputs into marine waters, because that is something that the state level government has some control over. Um, whereas carbon emissions are a little bit more difficult to address as a subnational jurisdiction. Uh, communications was one of the areas, just helping the public understand acidification and um, what they can do about it. And last, kind of concrete actions to support adaptation by affected parties. So I'm just going to run over one example each uh, for these. So reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Since this Blue Ribbon Panel report in 2012, there has been a lot of action on this front in Washington state. Um, ocean acidification has not been the primary driver here, uh, but our, the community focused on acidification has tried to put our issue out in front of people as an additional benefit to reducing CO2 emissions. So where I work, the Washington State Department of Ecology is one of two agencies that is putting the major carbon emissions control programs into practice. And there's a whole suite of them, the largest being the Climate Commitment Act, which was enacted in 2021 and has started, uh, it's a cap and invest program. So it sets a declining cap on carbon emissions by large industries. And each year that cap decreases. So industries that emit carbon have to buy allowances, um, which will become more expensive over time. And they will figure out ways to do business with less carbon emissions. Uh, the other major policies that are going to help us reach these statutory goals in 2030, 2040, and 2050 are the Clean Fuel Standards and the Clean Energy Transformation Act, uh, which will respectively reduce vehicle emissions and reduce emissions coming from electricity generation. So all of these policies together still don't get us all the way to where we need to go by 2050 in terms of net zero economy. Um, but we are marching along with all of these efforts to reduce carbon emissions and uh, address the root cause of acidification. For monitoring and forecasting ocean chemistry, this is a place where Washington has been really uh, fortunate and for the leadership of people within the state. <clears throat> so we are one of the places that has the best monitored carbonate chemistry in the world. Um, and this is through a broad partnership. So the history here really is um, some of these programs predate the action plan and had acidification parameters added on to existing marine monitoring programs. Uh, one of the first outcomes of the Blue Ribbon Panel was the creation of a coordinating body called the Marine Resources Advisory Council, which guides ocean acidification response in Washington state and the Washington Ocean Acidification Center, which is a group located within an academic group of institution, the University of Washington. And that's this uh, red group here, WOAC. So in 2014, a little bit before that, I think, uh, monitoring began through the Ocean Acidification Center. And then more recently, uh, the Department of Ecology uh, also added on to a long-term monitoring program, acidification parameters. And the details of these programs are all different, but over time, uh, they've kind of been meshed together uh, in complementary ways to co-locate chemical and biological observations um, to span a good uh, geographic length of uh, the state from the Canadian border down to the next state to the south and temporally to capture, in some cases, really detailed measurements over short periods of time and in other cases, uh, less frequent or more uh, spread over the year, every month of the year observations. So that at this point, we are getting really detailed information about acidification from all over the state to help us understand where we're going. So we knew initially that Pacific oysters were harmed by acidification from the impacts in hatcheries, but uh, studying important species is one of the recommendations in the action plan. And this again has been led uh, primarily by the Ocean Acidification Center. And over time, uh, laboratory studies, um, and in some cases, field studies, <clears throat> have helped us understand that additional species are at risk. And in some cases, the outcomes of these studies have shown that the species are resilient in the face of acidification. But salmon, dungeness crab, which is the most important commercial fishery on the west coast of the US, and oysters 
are all really important species for Washington and are all sensitive to some degree to uh, re reduce uh, mineral stability or increase CO2. So we're continuing this work to study important species um, and come to a more holistic understanding of how increasing CO2 in our waters is going to impact ecosystems and food webs. Um, we have also advanced pretty uh, detailed regulatory work around quantifying nutrient impacts. Most of this has been done on the basis of how nitrogen is affecting dissolved oxygen in Washington marine waters. Uh, but there has been work added onto that to understand when wastewater treatment plants put nitrogen into wa Washington marine waters, how that in the end affects carbonate chemistry and acidification. Um, and after doing that quantification, uh, the Department of Ecology has moved forward with policy to uh, mandate improved treatment of wastewater streams to reduce nitrogen inputs and uh, raise the amount of dissolved oxygen and preserve uh, better carbonate chemistry for sensitive species. So this is one that is more under the control of state government and has been a big focus of agency regulatory work. <clears throat> Raising awareness has been one component of this action plan. And this has taken many forms from uh, regular reporting out of the science work through symposia. Um, and then in some cases, directly connecting with the media whenever a new study has results that may be interesting to the public when a new species is found to be sensitive to acidification. Um, just one example from my own work is that because we're lucky in Washington to be in this position of having uh, robust data streams, um, digesting those data to give the public annual indications of the state of acidification is one direction we're going. So there is now an ocean acidification indicator that's being put out on an annual basis. I'm showing you here two, two of these indicators. One of them is for a recent calendar year, 2022. Um, and it shows the length of the season in Washington state that has favorable carbonate chemistry. Uh, so this is about half the year. And I'm also showing you below that the estimated uh, length of that same season prior to the emission of anthropogenic carbon. So this is just to help the public understand that the carbon dioxide we've put into atmosphere to date has already really narrowed this window of favorable chemistry and is putting uh, sensitive species under stress from acidification. So the goal of reducing carbon dioxide emissions and reducing nutrient inputs into marine waters is to keep this season as long as possible so that there is no further uh, stress on oysters, salmon, crabs, other sensitive species. And last around supporting adaptation, this can be a challenging thing to think of how to do for acidification. Um, one of the points that I usually try to make is that any species in marine waters is under stress from many directions, from uh, warming water, from reduced oxygen availability, from toxic chemicals that are washing into marine waters through storms. So acidification is one of many stressors and something we can do to uh, support resilience in the ecosystem and adaptation is tackle as many as much low hanging fruit as possible. So reducing stress from other sources will also help in uh, mitigating acidification impacts. But out of the action plan, some of the early actions which happened through uh, really close collaboration between shellfish farmers and scientists were uh, adapting these hatcheries. So kind of coming first full circle on this story Initially, acidification came to public attention through failures within hatcheries, and hatcheries have been able to adapt, for the most part, to acidification stress. So through monitoring the water that they pull into their facilities and then treating the water, they can preserve good conditions for oysters and the other species they grow um, and maintain good harvest outcomes on their farms. Um, the only point here is that this adaptation will become more difficult and more expensive over time as carbon continues to accumulate in marine waters. So adaptation is very important, but we want to uh, never let up on that drumbeat of addressing the root cause, the carbon dioxide emissions, so that we don't have to rely on uh, more and more extreme adaptation measures. So 
I think that is it as a very high level overview of uh, the acidification action plan for Washington state. Um, and the lessons I think are that this has really been successful only through this broad partnership between academic groups like the Washington Ocean Certification Center, state regulatory agencies like ecology, uh, growers themselves, affected industries, non-governmental organizations, and tribal governments in Washington. Um, so thanks for having me today. Thanks so much, Micah. That's a great uh, case study example, but also, you know, Washington State really being the leader on acidification policy response truly in the world. And uh, and that is just a, a special um, role that I appreciate you and all of the colleagues that you just mentioned uh, so much for and, and continue to see that being important um, and relevant. I think one of the things that I'm intrigued by with the work that you're leading now on this sort of like indicator sense of windows, you know, better or worse conditions on different days and how do we uh, measure that uh, or quantify that and how do we communicate that for different purposes. I think that's actually probably where a global community conversation is going on acidification. Most people that don't work on this topic just want to know what's the number, you know, tell us which pH level, you know, that no one knows about, you know, <laughs> about recognized saturation states, but, but even to say, you know, what's the pH number that we need to be worried about? What's our threshold? And of course, we all know that that's not quite how it works, but is there some sort of equivalent that we need to start communicating at a global level about whether it's, um, yeah, I mean, whether it's a, a aragonite uh, saturation states, whether it's a pH window, whether it's something else um, that we want to be uh, able to increasingly kind of maybe target research around at a regional level, uh, I think is probably a, a place we need to go to get to PB's point, which is how do we actually get um, sort of the attention when it comes to, you know, not quite specificity like parametrics, but something kind of like that, um, that starts to think about that risk, uh, putting it squarely in like a risk portfolio and, and an index is something that I think is important. So with that, um, thank you guys so much. Maybe I'll just open it up for um, questions or reactions. Um, got a little bit of time. I don't know, um, uh, Katerina and and Catherine, you can tell us, um, I, th I think it should be chat box. Is that accurate? We can have uh, the Q&A box for your questions, or you can Sorry. use the <laughs> raise your hand function and yeah. we can call on you to ask a question directly if you prefer that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll encourage you in the raise your hand function because I can see everybody here and I uh, would love to hear your voices if you're willing to share them. There's also a few questions already in the Q&A box, one for Inken and one for Micah. All right. Um, oh, okay, open, I see. Um, all right, over to Inken. Um, is the group that on good environmental status uh, is the MS the CG group that you're that you're an expert uh, on? Like, yeah, I think that's maybe more of a comment. <laughs> but yes, so do you want to share a little bit more about the group, uh, Inc, and what it is, and sort of what the, our opportunities are to sort of cross pollinate some of our recommendations and and evolve them over time as we're hearing uh, the discussion? Sure. Um. So the Commission Expert Group on Strategic Coordination for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, sorry for the long name. Okay. Uh, it is a, a group that tries to assist the commission, the EU commission directly in relation to any implementation of existing union legislation. Here, we're talking specifically about the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, obviously. Um, and besides this like more general big meetings, they have a couple of working groups as well. So I, I'm not quite sure if that is, um, the question, but there is one group on good environmental status that we are planning on attending. Um, but with that, we're still in the process of uh, finalizing this. So when it comes to the more smaller subgroups, uh, there are a couple of working groups that we're intending to join as well, but we're also a member of this like big, um, yeah, commission expert group now as well. Thanks, Inken. And, and I'll, other, I'll point out, Louisa, the sort of informal EU stakeholder group that, that you're uh, helping to lead 
um, you know, we'll have a feedback loop between what Incan's hearing and understanding there and sort of that conversation over the next year. So our hope is to sort of be that bridge between that uh, commission body and then, of course, all of the experts, some of you are, are here with us. Um, you know, that are part of that ex informal, you know, EU sort of advising, advising group to the OA Alliance. And I think the more that we can see that sort of develop at a regional level, at other regional levels around the world, um, is something that we're really, um, you know, certainly don't want to be the gatekeeper for, but certainly an example of and and, and to support as we as we can and, and as we go. Um, question to Micah um, from Dr. Feely in the chat. Uh, is has Washington State been working on plans for mitigation of OA um, and other approaches other than reducing CO2? So outside of reducing CO2, how else has the state been thinking about mitigating OA? Sure. Uh, I guess, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. in terms of mitigating uh, the drivers of acidification, it is mostly focused on the carbon emissions reductions and reducing nutrient inputs into marine waters. For mitigating impacts, I think it's broader than that. And some of that focus has been on getting the monitoring information to affected groups. So there are successful tools already in getting uh, forecasted conditions to shellfish growers so that they can understand when corrosive water is coming towards their farms. I think we're also getting to the point where we uh, have a better understanding within the small region of Washington state, which areas, um, basins are more or less extreme in terms of acidification conditions. And in the long term, that may help planning kind of where to site facilities um, uh, and potentially whether there are differences between populations in sensitivity to acidification that would be a way to mitigate harm to growers where we could um, point towards particular populations of crab or oysters that are more robust. Um, yeah. Can I add a finer point onto that, Micah? And I, I know from the Department of Ecology perspective, um, the, you aren't in charge necessarily in the same way, but um, the other conversation that's come up in the mitigation and adaptation side to ocean acidification and coastal acidification here at the COP has been things like marine carbon dioxide removal strategies, multiple. And uh, and I think that's one area where there really isn't a policy or regulatory landscape quite yet. Um, and that's a, a sort of a big blind spot, I think, both from the OA side uh, of policy, but also uh, ocean management and ecosystem-based approaches to, to management, um, but also obviously has massive implications for climate mitigation strategies. Anything to share from your perspective on if Washington State has come up, uh, you know, working groups or conversations you've been privy to to how Washington State's thinking about that topic? Yeah, that is still a pretty early um, area of policy in Washington State. So there really is not a, an integrated strategy for how marine carbon dioxide removal fits into acidification mitigation. But it is moving forward um, on kind of the very cutting edge basis. So the Department of Ecology very recently uh, in the last month has permitted the first uh, marine carbon dioxide removal um, facility in Washington mm -hmm. State. So uh, that is going to include monitoring requirements for their effects on water chemistry. And um, mm -hmm. that in the long run, that may be a kind of state-backed strategy to mitigate acidification, but it isn't yet. There's not um, agency pressure to um, roll out these technologies or even to test them. It's kind of, they are winding their way through the permitting process. And um, I, I think everybody is just kind of waiting to see what they, what they do and sort of how the economics play out as well. Great. Um, any other final questions for the good of the order before I turn it back over to our secretariat for uh, final final words? I don't think so. I just have a comment from Steve uh, from Stephen uh, saying, "Very happy to hear about all the progress that Department of Ecology has made on the OA front under Micah's leadership in the state," and agree. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us for the policy session for Go On Week 2024. Uh, Katarina, over to you, final words. Thank you so much. I just want to echo 
Jesse's words. Thank you, everybody, for participating, for listening in, for joining us today. Thank you also again to Katie Brown for helping to organize this whole thing. Catherine is one of our um, OA Week coordinators, without whom um, I don't think this session would have happened today. So I just want to acknowledge her as well as all of our presenters. Thank you so much. Uh, again, we encourage you to join Goa On to hear about all of these amazing things happening um, first off. And um, if you would like to get involved more in the leadership of Goa On and to help shape the network for the next year, we currently have an open call to join the Go On Executive Council. So I encourage you to look into that as well. And with that, thank you all again for participating. Thank you again to our panelists for the amazing presentations and to our audience for listening. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Never find that button. Got it. You <laughs> Do you need me for anything? <laughs> okay. No, we're good. <laughs> Thanks so much to both of you for organizing this. This has been a really good yeah. session.